This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. With supply chains becoming more complex, you need to stay on top of the latest logistics developments. So if you work with logistics, you need the Beyond the Box podcast from Maersk. It's the easy way to keep up to date with everything from digital disruption and logistics to the need for supply chain resilience in today's market. Find out more and keep ahead of the game with the Beyond the Box podcast on logistics insights at maersk.com slash insights. Hi, everyone. It's Paul Pulver. In this episode, I'm joined by Justin Straharsky, co-founder of Human.ai, an AI-powered crowdsourcing platform, to discuss the power of collective intelligence and AI in solving complex problems. Justin shares insights on how competition and collaboration can bring together global data scientists to tackle data challenges, emphasizing the importance of constraints and incentives in maximizing contributions. We explore the potential of AI as a thought partner, its role in creating a world of abundance, and the critical need for clear problem understanding and evaluation of AI outputs. As you'll hear in each episode, I ask all my esteemed guests what they recommend to elevate one's AIQ, so stick around to hear what Justin has to say. I hope you enjoy the discussion. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Elevate Your AIQ. I'm your host, Bob Pulver. With me today is Justin Straharsky. He is the co-founder of Human.ai. Welcome, Justin. Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Appreciate your time. Uh, it's good to see you again. It's been a while since we uh, talked about all things gig economy and uh, future of work. So why don't we just start by you giving a little bit of background about, you know, what your, you know, what you went to school for, what you've been doing and how you wound up founding. Oh, uh, yeah, I suppose long and winding road. I um, have a background in tech. I grew up in California and I worked for company called Sun Microsystems back in the day. And Sun was founded by a number of folks, one of whom is Bill Joy. And Bill's now famous for things that he said around the office, including something called Joy's Law, which is uh, essentially that it doesn't matter the size of your company, but most of the world's smartest people work for someone else. So that's been a guiding principle of my career since being exposed to that. Think a lot about what the world looks like when smart people are distributed around the world and how to take advantage of that. I started human because customers in another business that I started 10 years ago were asking us to do more with data science and AI. This is before the uh, Gen AI hype that we're currently in. Uh, and those customers were trying to do more with their data. They're trying to predict things, optimize things, understand when people are exposed to risk in their workplace and um, do predictive maintenance and things like that in large industrial settings. So we built a community of people around the world that could help them solve those problems. Challenge and competition based or is it collaborative across these, you know, sort of freelance data scientists or? Yeah, good question. I suppose it's kind of co-opetition, right? Most of it looks like a, uh, a competition but we're seeing lots of collaboration between the members of our community. They share methodologies. They like to help each other succeed. That's something that gets me super excited. But essentially what we've done is figure out what the right incentives are to get any group of people to contribute maximally to solving a problem. And that differs problem to problem. So if we're doing a small piece of analysis where the outcome is several reports, what we're interested in is what's the right number of people to contribute to solving that problem. A fundamental belief that we hold in human AI is that more answers are better than one. In particular, in data science, it's very useful to have multiple independent answers and see where they converge. That's important both for where they converge, giving you higher confidence in the result, but also for discovering outlier answers that might be valuable. So in something like that piece of analysis, we might get four people 
uh, each of whom is paid, but the one who submits in our customer's view, the, the best piece of work gets paid more. So we're, man we're maintaining that uh, competitive nature. And then we do model building competitions, which involve up to say 200 people from around the world and the top participants win a prize payout. And done. Really interesting. I mean, I, I have some familiarity with some of those types of models. I mean, I've, I've spoken to, you know, top coder and, you know, it's probably been seven years ago since, since I spoke to them on behalf of, you know, the companies that I was working for at the time, found that my company didn't have some expertise, but it was more, it was more a bandwidth issue as well as something that wasn't sort of core to their, their scope of responsibility, right? So it's either try to get their management to agree to let them, you know, contribute to this. Um, and then, you know, do you even have the structure to figure out how to do everything that you guys are doing? But, or do we just, we know this is a, you know, sort of time boxed sort of exercise anyway, and just from, from a scalability and, an, and maybe even an efficiency standpoint, uh, why not just throw it out to, you know, a diverse, you know, crowd who just be, like you said, incentivized to just crank it out. Yeah, what we're seeing in our customers is that it's capability and capacity. So even in large enterprises that we deal with, they have an internal data science team. They may have two, three, maybe more data scientists on staff. They also have data engineers. But even those teams have this long list of projects to get after. and Things don't get on the list even if they can't be proven to deliver value. So there's even some lost opportunity that happens because people aren't doing proof of concept work in data science, uh, the science part of data science, which proves um, the value of taking the next step. And so those teams suffer both from the capacity constraint, that is they have more work on than they can get done, but they also have a capability constraint, which is even in a team of three, how many of the different methodologies that make up data science and AI can you possibly bring to bear on the problems in your large enterprise? What that looks like is, you know, you may have an excellent um, person on staff who's good at time series data, but next week you want to do something with satellite data and they've never been exposed to working with satellite data, computer vision problems. And so we're finding that we, are very powerful in augmenting internal teams' capability and capacity. They do more, and they do it with skills that they need uh, now, and that allows their internal teams to focus on expanding their core competence, which really is becoming about knowing the business and that business's data better than anybody else. So they can be more effective as the stewards of awesome data science projects and having super skills, access to this distributed community of people with different skills and capabilities. No, that's fantastic. So um, when, when your crowd comes up with these solutions, whether it's the winning one or, or not, how does the, is there IP that's, that's generated? And if so, like where does, who gets that? Who gets the rights to that? Great question. And it really depends on the nature of the project. For most of those projects, the IP goes to the person who's sponsoring the competition, so our customers. But there are some competitions that we run where the, uh, the sponsor, the large enterprise that we're dealing with, understands that they don't have the internal capability or desire to carry a deal forward, to carry a solution forward. And they might want to stimulate the innovation ecosystem to produce a commercial product that then they can buy or they may want to collaborate on the production of some novel IP. So we've seen that in a number of cases where a customer of ours wants to engage our community to prove a hypothesis, whether it's something like, can we use machine learning to find exploration targets for copper? In that case, they may actually want to partner with the, the team or group of individuals who've built the best solution to commercialize something or to take the next step in building a solution that's specific to them. I guess I wanted to drill down into like the, the sort of cognitive diversity of the crowd, not in a not in a decision making way, which we'll we'll get into in a, in a minute, I'm sure, when we talk about how people are using AI, but more just the expertise and ex 
exposure from people that are coming from different backgrounds, either different industries or different geographies. I mean, I don't know, just from a, a lot of your projects originate in like, you know, industrial, you know, manufacturing, mining, things like that. I mean, are there people from different specific geographies that happen to have been exposed because of where they reside and where those industries have some prominence that they seem to be coming forth with like novel approaches to solving some of these problems? That's such a good question. And it really cuts both ways, actually. What we find is that the large industrial businesses that we work with in whether it's agriculture or manufacturing, mining, energy, they have access to people that have very detailed subject matter expertise. Some of them can walk into the room and know that a circuit breaker on an electrical substation isn't performing right. And they can't say how they know that. Some of them know about the data that their company has been gathering. They understand what a null value in a data set means. Does it mean the thing is being shut off on purpose? Is it failing? And some of that is required to build great data science solutions. And it is not necessarily the case that people around the world who have great data science skills have that subject matter expertise. And so sometimes the value is in bringing those people together in a project. Sometimes you're actually looking for outlier solutions. And those can come from people who do bring a skill that the company that has the subject matter expertise do not have. So whether it's the latest techniques in machine learning applied to a particular problem that they have or something else. So we, we're trying to figure out what the sweet spot is in combining subject matter expertise with the best mach machine learning data science skill set. What we know for sure is that the broader our reach, the, the better our ability to make that match happen. And what's unique about our approach is that we're not trying to predict that match. So we're not trying to evaluate beforehand and make a prediction about whether Bob would be great at solving this particular problem, we're trying to measure as objectively as possible the outcomes produced by a field of people who bring a diversity of skill. So that merit-based assessment of outcomes is super powerful for getting results on these kinds of uh, business challenges. Before we move on, I need to let you know about my friend Mark Pfeffer and his show, People Tech. If you're looking for the latest on product development, marketing, funding, big deals happening in talent acquisition, HR, HCM, that's the show you need to listen to. Go to the Work to Find Network, search up People Tech, Mark Pfeffer, you can find them anywhere. So when you put out a challenge or, you know, one of your clients, you know, kicks this off, do they give you parameters in terms of who they might be looking for? Or do they basically trust human AI to do that? Or is it just sort of, here, we're putting it up, it goes to the same place every other challenge goes to, and whoever starts to contribute, you know, contributes? Or is there any sort of filtering in terms of the exposure you give to the, to the challenge? I, I would say that it works kind of like a slider. If we imagine a slider between something where we don't know what the end solution is going to look like on, on one end of that slider, and on the other end, we know exactly what we want down to the operating environment that it must perform in. So our job at Human AI is to, to understand where any particular project sits and move that slider back and forth, and that determines the methodology that we bring to the table. So in the highly... Uh, specified case where we've got projects that are producing machine learning models that go into production in a particular environment, then uh, by the way that we scope and describe that to our community, the right people are opting in. Similarly, if we move the slider in the other direction, we may have to do some outreach of a particular nature to make sure that we are exposing that opportunity to people who are bringing a diversity of skill sets without bias to understanding which of those skills is going to be most effective at solving. On the one hand, we have things that look like innovation or novel solutions. And the other, we have things that look like projects for finding uh, the best solution to a very specified opportunity. Got it. Okay. I guess it's similar to writing a good job description, right? Like, are we going to 
be inclusive? Are we going to attract the, the right people that where this is going to resonate or maybe candidates that think I've got enough relevant experience plus a unique perspective or angle on this that would make me potentially successful? Harkens back to some of the the collective intelligence work that I was doing back at IBM. We probably talked about that um, last time we spoke, but but how do you, I guess it's a combination of collective intelligence and like collaborative decision-making. Like, do you have the right people in the room where you bring not just sort of diverse perspectives, but it's like the opposite of, a, of an echo chamber, right? You, you're bringing in these perspectives like you, you haven't considered, you know, this angle or you're not being, you know, human centric or you're not considering, you know, macroeconomic factors or whatever it is, right? Like, but each of those contributes to uh, an improvement, even if it's a sort of a rounding error kind of improvement, but each perspective gets you a slightly better, you know, prediction or slightly better, you know, decision in some ways. Yeah, I think that's right. What we have found is that constraints matter. So in our other open innovation business, we started out by running hackathons. And we brought these incredibly interesting challenges to people around the world. And then we put them in a room and we told them, you've got the weekend to solve this hard problem. You can use any tools you like, but you've only got two and a half days or whatever it was. And so there, the constraint of time really forced incredible creativity. Now, of course, most of the solutions at the end of the weekend weren't fully baked, but how powerful is it to see 50 or 100 different approaches to solving that problem in just a weekend before you then double down on spending more time and resources and fleshing any of those out? And so in human AI, we do spend time thinking about for any given data project, what are the right set of constraints for that project? And a lot of our work goes into engaging with customers to figure out those constraints. And as we get better at doing this, what we're discovering is that there are atomic units of data science. That's how we think about them. And those are the basic building blocks of any data project. And some of them can be thought of as independent projects. So whether you're doing um, a proof of concept on whether a data set might support a hypothesis that you have, that looks a particular way and needs a particular set of constraints and requires people with certain skills to advance that. Then if you're at uh, another stage and you're actually building a model that has to be deployed into production, you've got different constraints. And so the, the more that we can figure out what those atomic units, those project types look like, the better we are at spinning them up quickly with the right set of constraints to get the right outcomes. No, that's very cool. I guess when, when I think about constraints in a slightly different context, like when people agree to join this challenge and and contribute, I, perhaps this is in like their, you know, the, the T's and C's and the agreement. But like, like how do you know everyone's coming up with not unique solutions or code or whatever? But like, how do you know what they're contributing is is their own work? That is a, a great question, and unfortunately, it is the kind of detail that we have to get obsessed about and. Part of how we mitigate the risk of somebody doing something like stealing from somebody else is in the terms and conditions, as you've suggested. There are also just a lot of boring work bits that go into to doing that, like code reviews. And we're trying to automate that as much as possible. But there are, there are just a, a, a series of work steps that have to happen to prevent that kind of thing. Thankfully, we find that much of that can be avoided if we get the culture and the expectations right and we attract the right people based on the right incentive. That's not foolproof. Things always enter at the, at the edges, and that's why we have to have both contractual and operational controls. Yeah, no, that's not easy. I mean, I have a lot of conversations just in the context of responsible AI, have a lot of those you know, similar com conversations because people talk a lot about responsible use of AI. And certainly when we think about 
you know, talent acquisition and talent management and some of those use cases, it's, you know, the average user, well, the average person, I should say, is is a user and not a builder. But if you're going to do these things right, as you know, I mean, it starts where you're collecting data and writing, you know, algorithms or, you know, using code that maybe came from a shared repository, maybe it came from a an accepted, you know, methodology in a in a research or academic community, but you're still making potentially an assumption that, you know, fair and and transparent and it's okay to to use that. Um, but you've really got to think about being responsible by design. And that includes, you know, fairness and being ethical and responsible, transparent, explainable, all these things. And so, and I think with generative AI, that's even more the case because now anyone can technically create GPT or Copilot or agent uh, themselves. And we're all builders now, but I think the same sort of concepts apply. And honestly, no, I mean, no one's completely figured it out, right? Do you, do you try to catch it at the point of, of decision? Uh, when something is going about to be used and you're you know perhaps inappropriately trusting that the system gave you an output that was correct you know treating it like a like a calculator or do you go back and do some type of continuous you know monitoring and have the the traceability and the observability all the way back to the beginning of the sort of data supply chain the short answer from from our perspective is the transparency and observability piece that you mentioned is very important. So we have people submit not just the solution, but the source code that generates that solution. And that allows us to go back and see every piece of code that was used to generate the solution has to be reproducible, and we have to know where things came from. And so being able to inspect libraries that people use, understand where those libraries came from, attribute the uh, intellectual property to the authors of that intellectual property where required, is an important step for us, just just being able to really understand the solutions that are submitted and, and the building blocks uh, from which they were created. We're all standing on the shoulders of giants, and, and we've got to figure out how to uh, recognize people's contributions where, where they make them. We're in the lucky position of being able to celebrate people who are genuinely making a lot of novel solutions, and that's great. They're not doing that with entirely novel tools. They're using tools that are built by others, of course. That's part of the game and figuring out exactly how to recognize that contribution from others is something that, that, that we're all putting in best efforts on. I think that's great. Yeah, there's been so much, you know, innovation happening and I think we've just gotta we can't default to just assuming anything. I mean we can't lose our humanity and our and our critical thinking uh, when we apply these things. So I think it's just a matter of everybody, you know, thinking more deeply about that. I think sometimes Lately, it seems like we've been focusing so much on like productivity, like, oh, this is helping me do something faster and whatever. And so in some ways I feel like we've got to realign incentives, quality over, <laughs> you know, throughput. And so I think that'll, that'll come with time. I mean, honestly, I think sometimes that if people had started automating things back when some of the earlier automation platforms came out, like almost a decade ago at this point, they wouldn't be so fascinated with this basic, you know, robotic process, you know, automation. But we are where we are, and it's a little bit unfortunate that everyone's sort of conflating automation with augmentation and and AI. But that's okay. I'm just glad that people are have woken up. So sort of a double edged sword, right? When generative AI came into the public consciousness, it was good to start to see where things could go wrong, but also get people exposed and I guess ready to start to upscale themselves and figure out where and how it can help. So in that regard, I guess I'm curious, you know, how often AI is, is used in some of your projects and where do you see or you know, do you see AI coming in to help in, in the whole process of executing these projects? Great question. And to, and to your earlier point, the, the, the rise of generative AI and the natural tendency that people have to refer to AI, AI as, a, as a blanket 
technology and, and usually meaning generative AI in that, in that case has created some awesome opportunities and some challenges. I often feel like I'm using different language with, with different parts of my community. So when I'm engaged with senior leaders, boards and execs, they're, they're frequently very concerned with how they do more AI, how to get more AI in the business. Uh, and they have people in their businesses who have been building machine learning solutions for quite some time and doing data science and analytics for a lot longer than that. And uh, understanding the, the, the background that each individual brings to how they conceptualize a problem, what they're trying to achieve, helps me to have those kind of conversations and tease out what are we trying to accomplish. The actual use of generative AI in, in our solutions, we're super excited to, to be a user ourselves of that technology. One simple and straightforward example is it's so powerful when you have multiple different solutions in different formats or similar formats. I suppose let's take a, a piece of analysis that generates reports. We have four independent people produce four reports about when somebody is likely to be injured at work, say. Generative AI is fantastic for the consumer of that analysis to look across those four reports and find things that they all agree on and that can uh, drive a decision or an action on the part of the organization. So we're excited to use generative AI in cases like that to help our customers consume the awesome work of human beings. Some generative AI might be used in building those solutions as well, uh, and we're fairly agnostic outside of the constraints that we define for any project, what tools people use to get there. If we, if we build constraints around the outcomes and we can be relatively agnostic about how people get to those outcomes, that's, that's fantastic for creativity and stimulating the best possible solution. So people do use generative AI in coding and in coding their machine learning solutions. And that has increased the power of our community to do work and we're excited about that. Might there be an opportunity for AI to identify where, like, let's say, let's say you got like six people, like, could it look at the backgrounds of those people and using this, like, a, I guess a known unknown, you know, concept, like, could it know that there's something missing? Like, there's another perspective that's missing and you might want to leave the, the open call to contribute open for another couple days or to do out, you know, outbound, you know, sort of recruiting in a way for someone who might have some specialized expertise that would make the ultimate solution. That's a that's a great question, and and to be honest, uh, until you asked it, I haven't thought about how we might apply it in in that way, and I I think it's something that I'll I'll certainly look into. I have I have a hard time imagining the the unknowns piece. And, and how generative AI or any other AI would understand that there is a missing puzzle piece that, that didn't come from one of the inputs into the problem. But I think it can be certainly very powerful for going, here, here are all the inputs. We were talking about constraints earlier. If we know what the constraints of the, the end solution need to look like, have we got the representation in the people who are participating that we think is required to get there? Personally, I'm less excited about doing that work on the basis of predictors in the people and more excited about actually comparing outcomes because I'm, a, I'm motivated by thinking about merit-based approaches to doing this that allow us to blow the top off of the talent pool around the world and create opportunities for people that otherwise wouldn't get a look at, at some of these opportunities. So we, we want to engage people regardless of where they went to school, what they looked like, what they what they do during the day, what their last name is, and any of that kind of stuff. And so so that means we have a strong focus on uh, paying attention to to the the merit of a solution and to making sure that we specify the nature of a of a problem so that we get great outcomes rather than trying to predict who based on their characteristics is going to be good at solving that problem. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, I was throwing it out as, as a hypothetical, but based on some of the things that I saw, like when I was at IBM, I was connecting like C-suite clients to, to IBM Research. And so when when Watson was coming out of the labs, I saw a lot of the, the demonstrations and the use cases that the research team and the chief investigators of those projects were 
were presenting. And so like one of them was a healthcare example, you know, patient living in Arizona had this something on, you know, on their skin and like, they couldn't understand where, where it came from. Nobody could figure it out, but part of it was because they weren't asking the right questions, which I mean, <laughs> the end result was all the doctors in Arizona had never practiced medicine elsewhere. And they never asked the question of where else this person lived. And so none of the doctors in Arizona had ever been exposed to uh, Lyme disease, right? Which was mainly where deer reside, which is predominantly in the Northeastern United States or whatever. So, I mean, it's a simple example, but like if you had the means to assemble a medical team. You wouldn't have all, you know, internists. You'd have different specialists. And maybe if you could only have three or four specialists, they'd be aligned to your own, you know, medical family, medical history and any, you know, you wouldn't just pick, you know, random specialists, but you'd assemble a team where you knew you had, you know, 95% of your possible future, you know, ailments uh, sort of covered, right? So, you know, it's a, it's a risk mitigation strategy in some sense. Yeah. I mean, and there's a sweet spot, isn't there, between going as wide as possible and and getting getting an outcome in a reasonable amount of time and you know that, that can actually be implemented and it's impossible i think to to know exactly how to draw that that curve uh our job is to, to try to figure that out and especially in running open innovation challenges it was, it was incredible to continually be surprised and impressed that somebody that had a skill that you wouldn't think would be applied to this problem could could make a difference. So one of the one of the experiences I had that gives me chills to this day and keeps me involved in this kind of business is that we were trying to solve a problem for a mining customer that wanted to discover where mineral sands are likely to be deposited. And it turns out that there are these J-shaped bays where wave action historically has deposited mineral sands. But now they're covered by foliage and other things. So it's relatively hard through computer vision approaches at the time to, to try to locate all of them. And there was a uni team who was super keen on music. And they just asked themselves, could our experience in digital, digital signal processing be applied to this problem? And that led them to convert a particular data set into another format that allowed them to use their skills in digital signal processing to identify all of the historic J-shaped bays around the world in the course of the region. And that conceptual leap from this is a problem of looking at these visual shapes to, to one in which they were using waveforms and techniques that they developed for, for music was brilliant. And, and I couldn't have predicted that they would be successful at that. I couldn't have gone out and gone, well, we need somebody with digital signal processing in the room. So what we were doing was trying to engineer serendipity. And the whole nature of those open innovation events was creating the, the right magic, the right constraints on time, but openness to different skill sets to foster an environment in which magic like that happened. And when it does, it's electrifying and people get super excited about it. And that's kept me going for, for a very long time. And figuring out the, the right amount of that to pull into any data challenge it is, is something that I think about. Not everyone is, requires innovation like that. And they're, they're, tremendous uh, long tail of work to be done and high value problems to be solved, where it's pretty clear we need somebody with machine learning skills just to get this, this thing done. And the solution needs to look like this for us to act on the recommendations of that model. That's also awesome. And what's great about that is there are people all over the world where we don't have to, to, to necessarily hire somebody that goes into our local office to solve that, that problem. And so I bring that same excitement to finding the right skills wherever they happen to be and to trying to figure out how we measure the, the outputs of those types of projects on the, on the basis of their ability to solve the problem. I don't know. That gets me excited as, as well. I mean, I, when you have experienced people who are sort of systems thinkers and they can extrapolate, you know, concepts and, and ideas uh, from one domain to another, it's hard to even put a value on that. But I know, you know, I've, I've pivoted quite a few times in my career. I mean, even in my over two decades at IBM, I did a lot of very different 
things, but there was always not just transferable skills, but, but knowledge that I carried from one to another. And, you know, I guess even the, the scenario that I depicted finding these known unknowns, I mean, you do have the constraint. I think this ties to your point. You're still subject to whatever data is available about people and their backgrounds. And there's so many things. I mean, I could have a whole second alternative resume with all the things that were not part of my job descriptions uh, over the course of my career. And so I don't know if AI will ever be able to, you know, figure that out, not necessarily debt back to an individual, but AI where it could actually go now that it's absorbed, you know, so much information and continues to you know, ingest more, more data every day. But I do wonder about that kind of thinking and assimilation of all that knowledge and data and being able to come up with novel solutions, novel projects based on everything it knows across different industries. I, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe it could do that today. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know. But, but what I do know about today and what it can do now is that it can function as an incredible thought partner. Have you ever had that experience where you vibe with somebody else and you're talking about they, the future of working in AI like we are, and new information, new knowledge is created in the creative spark that happens between two minds? I think the promise of AI right now that it can deliver on is freeing us from being trapped in our own singular minds, and it can be a thought partner that stimulates that creativity. So I think that it has tremendous power for helping us be more human and bring our best creative and uh, skills of ingenuity to the table in problem solving. And, and I, I suspect that it can, it can do that now for lots of different problems and for, and for people. And that's something to be excited about, regardless of whether it can do that independently on its own in the future. Fair point. I mean, I've been spending a lot of time, <clears throat> excuse me, with, with Ross Dawson, um, who's a futurist and speaker, and he's got some amazing resources on these kinds of concepts of how, AI is enhancing our own thinking and, you know, putting things in perspective with the human, sort of the human first, and then adding AI as needed to, to complement that. But one of the threads within these, these conversations and some of the resources that, that he's created are not just augmenting individual human creativity and ingenuity, but the pairing of collective human intelligence with artificial intelligence and you know because ai has not absorbed has not actually absorbed all you know human collective intelligence by any stretch and so how do you have it in the room you know with you It'd be interesting to see if an ai could actually contribute to some of your projects uh, on its on its own but um i don't know maybe that ties too closely to basically being the missing you know puzzle piece itself but but yeah, I just think it's it's really it's fascinating to think through some of these things and and what previously intractable problems could be could be solved. So am I, and I, I also like to be a champion for the boring problems because we're standing on the the brink of being able to make fantastic shifts in the ability of our core industries to operate sustainably and effectively to free up our time and resources for doing other things. And it might be that m the majority of those gains come from solving lots of little problems, adding 5% efficiency here, increasing safety there. And the sum total of, of all of those boring business problems that our, that our industries face actually is a is a uh, powerful force for for us being better humans and 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 being more creative and living in the world that we want to live in a world of abundance where no longer are we plagued by that annoying possibly more than annoying safety risk or the, the fact that we can't eke out more performance from that transformer it's on, on their own perhaps they, they're not so sexy as some of the other problems that we talk about solving but taken together they they create a, a possibility for lifestyle and fulfillment. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, there's plenty of daily 
you know, challenges that you're just like, wait, we just kind of leaped over <laughs> solving all these, you know, pervasive um, and fundamental, you know, challenges with, with how we engage with AI or where it can provide, you know, contextual, you know, guidance or whatever. I mean, I even just driving around running errands, I mean, I can't, I can't tell it where I want to go and then just have it plot an optimal, you know, route. I can't divert from once I've got uh, my destination and in, in ways or whatever mapping you're using, like to, to add a stop, an unexpected stop, and then, you know, re reroute everything. No, that's a great one. Your your time is is valuable. It's the most precious precious resource you you have, and freeing up some of that from being stuck in traffic or or whatever it is is a is a good. And we should be pursuing that good with the tools that we have at our disposal, and AI is one of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Any particular tools that you've been playing with on the generative AI front that you're getting value from? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've played with, with lots of them, and, and I like all of them. I don't have a particular favorite. I'm, as you can tell, I'm excited about the, the people part, and the, the, the name of the business says it all. So I try to spend my time engaging with the, with the community of people that we've got and our customers and getting them excited about the potential for the application of that technology. I also get some somewhat frustrated at seeing people captured by the sexiness of a tool rather than what it feels like to really solve a hard problem. And so I feel like I'm I'm the boring guy in the corner trying to bring us all back to the to the problem at hand and, and solving that and painting the picture of what a great world it's gonna be if we just make that thing more efficient or if that thing doesn't blow up uh, as a result of using the tool. Who cares about the tools? Let's get to that world where we're happy that the the things aren't gonna blow up and we got time to spend with our loved ones and things like that. It's a great use of technology, regardless of what it is. Absolutely. So, um, so Justin, I have to have to ask you the question that I ask all my guests, and it ties to the title of of the podcast. When you when you hear that phrase, elevate your AIQ, what comes to mind? What comes to mind is all of the discussions that I've been in about artificial intelligence, where people's deeply rooted fears come to the surface and how much capture there is of that fear, or on, on the other hand, the over-optimism about some, some future. So I'm, I'm excited about people developing the ability to engage with tools practically and understand how they can apply them in their own lives, how we can apply them at, at work, to create the outcomes that, that we want, and to do that without being captured by other agendas and carried away by, by either fear or over-optimism. Again, that's that's me being the, the the boring guy, but I think that requires a bit of AIQ to pick apart the terminology that we use. What are we talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence? Are, are we talking about something that has independent volition? We're talking about AI, or, or are we talking about a system that that optimizes something on the basis of data that we've got? And and sometimes we, I find myself in conversations where we are confusing lots of terms. And people are getting excited, and that be that's because of some uh, fear that they're bringing to the table. And so, really engaging with that, I think, is what AIQ means for me. Going going deep enough that you can come to the table with an informed perspective about what are we trying to achieve here, and and what are we talking about when we use the language that is so popular. Absolutely fantastic. No, I, I think it's easy to get overwhelmed. It's easy to trust <laughs> what you get from. You know, as an output from some of these tools. So, as I mentioned before, keep thinking critically about what we're trying to accomplish, and does this sound right? Even if it sounds right, you know, maybe I should sort of double check it, get a second opinion. And it's easy to get overwhelmed just because there's so much. It's dominating the headlines. There's so many new tools every week, and it's progressing really fast. But I think you got to focus on the things that are providing you value in your in your personal life and in your work and sort of ignore a lot of the noise. Uh, Justin, thank you so much for your time. Uh, an awesome conversation, as always, and uh, really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, likewise, Bob. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, man. Thanks again, Justin. All right, that's a wrap for another episode. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.